she was known in the Japanese media. So before I get started, I wanted to mention that my last video was a tattoo video. Um, I got a new tattoo in New York City, and I did a bit of like a travel vlog kind of thing along with it. So it's on this hand if you'd like to see that tattoo, and if you're interested in New York City travel vlogs, that kind of thing. Um, I'd really appreciate it if you went and gave it a watch because I worked really hard on it and then I released it and YouTube was just like, oh, this video, yeah, we're not going to show it to anyone. Basically, I don't know why YouTube decided to take a giant crap on that video, but to anyone who already watched it, I really appreciate you. Um, and like I said, I'd very much appreciate it if you went and gave that video a watch. But anyway, also in the same vein, leave me a like and a comment on this video and if you're not subscribed to my channel please subscribe Kazuko Fukuda was born in 1948 in Matsuyama a city in Ehime prefecture which is on Shikoku Island in Japan which is um yeah there's the main island which is called Honshu and then there's various other islands this particular island Shikoku Island is across the bay from Hiroshima, like pretty much parallel to it if you know where Hiroshima is in the south, like a bit more southern in Japan. Her parents got divorced when she was really young and she stayed with her mother who ended up managing a prostitution ring which she ran out of their house in Shikoku Chuo City, Ehime. In high school, Kazuko's boyfriend was killed in an accident, and she ended up dropping out in the first semester of her third year, which I meant to look that up, but I didn't. Um, I think Japanese high school might only be three years instead of four. I'm not positive about that, but she was probably either a junior or a senior in high school when she dropped out. A year later, in 1966, when she was 18 years old, she'd already moved out of her mother's house and was living with her boyfriend who was a different one than the one who passed away, obviously. To make some easy money, the two of them decided to rob the house of the head of the Takamatsu Regional Taxation Bureau. Why they picked him, I have no idea, honestly, but they got caught. After being convicted, she was sent to do her time at Matsuyama Prison. And what happened there would later be known as the Matsuyama Prison Incident, which is the Matsuyama Keimusho Jiken. And what happened then was between 1964 and 1966, Yakuza, who were, you know, Japanese gangsters, regularly paid off prison guards to get into the prison, where they were allowed to do whatever they wanted. And that ended up being, as I'm sure you can probably imagine, drinking, smoking, gambling, and raping the female inmates, one of whom was Kazuko Fukuda. There ended up being a mild otherwise known as half-assed investigation into the prison in the 60s when the issue was brought up by the House of Counselors and two assistant jailers ended up committing suicide in June and July 1966. That was the most justice any of the female inmates who were attacked got, though, because no charges were ever brought against anyone involved. In 1999, Kazuko Fukuda published her autobiography titled Valley of Tears, 14 years, 11 months, and 10 days on the run. A bit of a spoiler there, I guess. Which made the public aware of just how bad it had been at that prison. By that time, though, the statute of limitations for any crimes the guards had committed was long gone. The word of the day for this video is going to be statute of limitations. I guess it's more than one word, but you get the idea. Since it's going to keep coming up after Kazoku got... Kazoku... Kazuko... Kazoku means family in Japanese. Anyway, after she got out of prison, now 20 years old, she ended up getting married. Her marriage was too boring, since her husband was a fisherman and they lived in a small fishing town on the island Kurushima, and she ended up divorcing him after five years. She got married a second time one year later, and at that point she started to be able to put the past behind her as she settled into a comfortable safe middle-class life in Matsuyama, Aichi Prefecture. She and her husband had four children together, but her comfortable life turned lavish pretty quickly as she started picking back up the bad habits she'd been surrounded by in the past and had gotten used to. Those habits included drinking, gambling, and buying the nicest clothes from the highest-end department stores in her area that she could, regardless of whether or not she could afford them. It didn't take long for her to end up deep in debt, owing about 2.5 million yen, which
which is equivalent to 3,409,372 yen after inflation, which would be about 25,600 US dollars. And she owed that money on various credit cards and another 1 million yen to an acquaintance, bringing her to a total of more than $30,000 of debt in today's money. Which I guess, like, all the things considered probably isn't that bad, but, like, it's not good either, that's for sure. To try and pay back that debt, she started working as a hostess, which is a job in Japan where women at hostess bars entertain groups of men by pouring drinks, flirting, listening to them talk, singing karaoke for them, with strict no-touching and no-nudity rules in place. Despite that, sometimes hostesses do end up going on dates and even going home with customers to make extra money outside the bar. One perk of the job was that customers were strongly encouraged to buy their hostess drinks, and Kazuko loved to drink. The job fit with her flashy nature, and it paid better than being a secretary or something like that. But it definitely didn't pay enough for her to keep the credit card companies from breathing down her neck. Hostesses work late nights, and being 34 years old and a mother and wife by this point, the partying and drinking lifestyle started to take a toll on her home life. As if that wasn't enough, she was also seeing another man on the side, a salary man who didn't know anything about her husband or family. And a salary man, if you're unfamiliar with that term, is just basically like an office worker. After a while, Kazuko started eyeing up one of her co-workers, 31-year-old Atsuko Yasuoka. She was one of the most popular hostesses at their club, good-looking and charming, always wearing the best clothes, jewelry, and accessories, and she always had a happy, easygoing, stress-free demeanor. Basically, she was everything Kazuko wanted to be. Even more than that, she had the kind of money Kazuko wanted, which she realized one night when they were packing up to go home, and Atsuko opened her wallet, letting Kazuko see that she'd made a huge amount of tips that night. So Kazuko asked Atsuko if she could come visit her at her place sometime, and she did that on August 19th, 1982. She went over to Atsuko's apartment and strangled her to death. Afterward, she took more than 300 items of Atsuko's from the apartment, like clothes, furniture, jewelry, and even Atsuko's bank book that showed her account had over 9.5 million yen in it, which is $90,000 back then, or about 72715 today. In total, all of that would be more than enough to pay off all of her debt and keep her in the lifestyle she'd become accustomed to. Before Kazuko... Kazuko... Yeah. Before she could keep the money and sell the furniture, though, she needed to prevent the police from finding Atsuko's body. So she came up with a plan that would make anyone looking for Atsuko assume that she'd abandoned her apartment and life and run away, which in Japanese is known as Yonike. Yonike. Yeah, which means night flight. Running away under the cover of night, usually to avoid one's creditors, which is ironic. And it also didn't really work. After Kazuko, I keep getting abused with Kazuko and Kazoku, but her name isn't Kazoku, it's Kazuko. After her husband found out what she'd done, somehow, I don't know how he found out, he told her that she should probably turn herself in. But she was like, no. Instead, she got him to help her bury Atsuko's body in the mountains in Matsuyama. Kind of a 180 there. After that, she stayed in Matsuyama, living her life as usual, as far as I could tell. The incident became known as the murdered hostess of Matsuyama, which in Japanese is Matsuyama Hostess Satsukai Jiken. The reason police caught on to Kazuko. Kazuko was because she was witnessed moving the furniture she'd stolen into her side piece's apartment, and since the police were considering it a robbery murder at the time, they started to look into her because of the robbery aspect. So, you know, she'd gone missing, basically, and I guess the cops knew that she'd been murdered. I don't know how, though. There wasn't a lot of details that I found on that. And that's sort of a side note to the whole story, honestly, which you'll see in a minute. So after a while, investigators started to close in on Kazuko. One night, the police called her house to ask her to come into the station for questioning. 
she got out of it though by pretending to be one of her kids on the phone and saying that her mom was out but would be back soon. After hanging up, she took the 600,000 yen, which is about $6,000 in cash that she'd stolen from Atsuka and fled from Matsuyama. When the cops got to her house, they found only her husband there, who they arrested for abandoning a corpse. Originally, Kazuko planned to go to Aomori Prefecture, saying, quote, I was going to atone for my evil deed by going to a secret area, saying a prayer, and committing suicide. But I got on the wrong train and ended up in Kanazawa. Kanazawa is the capital of Ishikawa Prefecture on Japan's central Honshu Island. For reference, the nearest big city is Kyoto, and by car, Kanazawa is about three and a half hours north, right on the coast. It's about 620 kilometers from where she started out in Matsuyama. And I meant to, I meant to translate what that was into miles, but it's usually like half, right? So it'll probably be like 300 miles or something, or maybe 200 and change if it's 3.5 hours, but you get the idea. She stayed in Kanazawa, where at first she had a hard time finding a hostess job again, since usually hostesses are between the ages of 16 and 30, and Kazuko was 34. Eventually, she got a job at a snack club in Kanazawa City. And snack clubs are basically... They're called snack in Japanese. And they're a very popular facet of nightlife all over Japan. Usually, they're smaller bars that revolve around an older female proprietor known as a mama, who provides a comfortable and relaxing environment for the usually mostly male customers to drink and socialize. Of course, they also sell snacks, though they're usually pretty simple, like homemade side dishes or nuts and crackers. The mama is usually the only employee there, and she chats, mixes drinks, lights cigarettes, and sings duets on the shop's karaoke machine. Whenever a snack bar has other employees, though, they're usually female, and unlike hostesses, they don't flirt with the customers, mostly staying behind the bar to interact with them. Two days after she got her new job, she went to a hospital in Tokyo, where she got plastic surgery on her nose and eyes to make her look different. That wouldn't be her only surgery during her time on the land, though. She moved from place to place, always working to stay one step ahead of the police. Of course, it would be impossible to run from them forever, but she didn't have to either. At the time, in the 80s, murder had a statute of limitations, if you can believe that. And it was only 15 years. Once that time was up, she'd be a free woman. The U.S. doesn't have a statute of limitations on murder, though apparently some states do. Like, I was looking into it, and I saw something that said, like, Connecticut has a statute of limitations, but it's like 40 years, not 15. So I don't know if that's true or not, but yeah, most other countries also don't have a statute of limitations on murder, so it's weird that Japan did. But anyway, while working at the snack bar in September 1985, she hooked up with a male customer who owned a long-running confectionery shop, which apparently had been in the family for three generations. Pretty impressive, honestly. She ended up going to work at that shop with him, and the sales really went through the roof after she did. The confectioner ended up proposing to her, but she didn't accept right away, afraid that her past would come out if they got married, since at that point she was on a nationwide wanted list, and wanted posters with her face and all her info on them were being circulated all over. I didn't say it that much, but the murder took place in 1982, so it's already been like three years at this point. One article I read said that they did end up getting married, but either way, she got kind of complacent in her new life. I guess after being there for a couple years, that's bound to happen, right? Enough to take a risk and bring one of her sons, 18-year-old Toshiyuki, who she'd reestablish contact with at some point, to Kanazawa around 1986 to work with her at the convection shop, and she pawned him off as her nephew, not her son. Her sense of security was misplaced, though, since the confectioner's relatives had started to get suspicious of her since she apparently was reluctant to put her name on the family register, which I don't really know what that is, but I'd imagine it's some kind of legal thing. The family member who was suspicious ended up going through Kazuko's son's things and found his driver's license, which made them even more suspicious enough to go to the police, which they did on February 12, 1988. Though another article I read said, it, said that it was in 1989. 
Washington Post. 
post, quote, anyone who did a bad thing should have to pay for it. Along with those two things, a prepaid telephone card with their image was issued and given out, which I guess is like putting missing kids' images on milk cartons. Like, I guess people just bought prepaid phone cards a lot, so they slapped her image on it. A large-scale TV special program about Kazuko that aired just before the statute of limitations caught the eyes of regular customers at the Oden restaurant that she worked at in Fukui. As the Fukui Shimbun tells it, the turning point in the case took place on July 24th when a 59-year-old male customer at the Oden restaurant tipped off police, telling them that a woman who looked like Kazuko Fukuda worked there. At the time, Kazuko was using the alias Yukiko Nakamura. At around 2 p.m., police stopped by the restaurant to take a look for themselves. While they were there, Kazuko, I don't know if she like sat down or if she was just like serving them, but she ended up drinking and eating with those police. And they questioned her and she answered their questions pretty readily, but didn't agree to let them take her fingerprints. They didn't need to, though, because they got their prints off some maracas that were used for karaoke at the restaurant, along with from the beer bottles that she had been drinking from during the questioning. They came back a match, and the police arrested her at approximately 6.40 p.m. without incident. Kazuko was well known as a gambler, drinker, and big spender on clothes, as I've said, which was reinforced by what she was wearing when she was arrested. An orange jacket, tight white skirt, and a gold and silver double necklace with a white bandana wrapped around her reddish-brown hair. The front page of the July 24, 1997 issue of the Ehime Shimbun newspaper read in big letters, Suspect Kazuko Fukuda Arrested. They held her overnight at the Fukui police station, then brought her to the train station the next morning to take her back to Matsuyama to be processed at the Matsuyama Higashi police station. Since her story was such a big deal in the media, by the next morning her arrest was well known, and a media swarm assembled in Fukui. As detectives, including a female one, which one article I read went out of its way to point out, so I figured I'd include that too, escorted Fukuda to the station, reporters, and cameramen surrounded them. At one point, she let out a scream from beneath the jacket that was covering her face. Probably nobody was happier about the rest than Kunihiko Nakai, the police detective of the Matsuyama, the chief detective of the Matsuyama Higashi police station at the time. Quote, on television, I heard that unmistakable voice he told the Fuji News Network earlier that year, or well, that year. It was then that I had faith it was her in Fukui. They rode the train from Fukui station to Okayama station, which is about a three hour ride, and then they went from Okayama station by car to Matsuyama Higashi police station. According to reported sightings, investigations, and her eventual testimony, while she was running from the police, she moved around all over Japan, including Hakodate all the way up north on the island of Hokkaido, Aomori and Niigata in the north of the main island, and Osaka, which is almost as far south as where she'd started. In Osaka, she said she was homeless and lived in a cardboard box. She'd end up having about 20 different pseudonyms over that time as well. During the interrogation, Kazuko said that she didn't murder Atsuko, but that she'd been there when the man who did kill her did it, claiming that she was just an accomplice. Police looked into the man that she mentioned and found out that he'd already died, so they couldn't exactly talk to him. The statute of limitations was said to expire in six days, so the police needed to prove that the man Kazuko claimed was the killer had an alibi and wasn't involved in the crime, and they needed to do that fast. If they couldn't, the prosecution would have a tough time in court. Basically, they had to prove, at the very least, that the man wasn't in Matsuyama at the time of the incident, regardless of whatever he might have been doing. You know, if he wasn't there, could have done it, obviously, so... Quote, if it could not be proven that her claim of conspiracy with another person was a lie during those six days, there was a chance that the statute of limitations would expire without prosecution. Then Chief Detective Nakai said, Police found some relatives of the man, but of course they couldn't remember what he was doing 15 years before, on August 19th, 1982. Luckily, they had an old diary that the man had written. Quote, an examination of the diary showed that he was in Tokyo on business at the time. He was not 
Kan Ehime, let alone in Matsuyama. Nakai said, Kazuko was indicted for murder on August 18th, just 11 hours before the expiration of the statute of limitations. Kazuko's story captivated the public, so much that an estimated 1,900 people waited in line to sit in the gallery at the Matsuyama District Court at the beginning of her first trial. Legendary baseball player Hideki Matsui, a native of Ishikawa Prefecture, which is where Kanazawa is, was a customer of the candy shop that Kazuko worked at while he was an elementary school student. Quote, she was a lovely looking lady, Matsui said during an interview after her arrest. Police and prosecutors said that Kazuko killed the club's top earning hostess to pay off debts to a loan shark that at the time were costing her about 100,000 yen, which would be about $1,000 every month, and that it was a cold and calculated crime. Her defense team appealed that and asked for leniency, saying that it wasn't a cold-blooded murder, but something she did in the heat of the moment, because Kazuko was actually a lesbian who was attracted to Atsuko and killed her out of passion. Judge Toshio Shima wasn't buying it, though, and he basically said, quote, the defendant's statement is unnatural and cannot be believed without substantiating evidence. On May 31, 1999, the Takamatsu District Court sentenced Kazuko, Kazuko to life in prison. The court ruled that the murder was not premeditated, but the robbery was. That ruling was upheld by the Takamatsu High Court the following year. On December 13, 2000, the appeal was dismissed at the Takamatsu High Court, like I said. Even though the public had been fascinated with her case, the interest faded after her conviction, with only 50 people coming to the announcement of the denial of her appeal. She was transferred from Matsuyama Prison to Takamatsu Prison. Kazuko appealed to the Supreme Court, but in November 2003, that appeal was also dismissed. She ended up getting transferred again to Wakayama Prison in Wakayama City. Kazuko went on to write a book about her life, like I mentioned earlier, called The Valley of Tears, which, like I said before, brought a lot of attention to the prison incident that I talked about in the beginning. In February 2005, Kazuko collapsed while working at a factory at the jail, you know. She was sent to a hospital where it was found that she'd had a subarachnoid hemorrhage, or, you know, an aneurysm, a brain aneurysm. She never woke up and ended up passing away on March 10th at the age of 57. So she only ended up serving five years of jail time. In 2010, Japan's diet, which I guess is the government, uh, revised the criminal procedure law to abolish the statute of limitations for murder. Damn, in 2010. Even though she's passed away and the story's long finished, her memory lives on in the public. You know, in the public consciousness. Fuji TV broadcast a dramatized version of Fukuda's story of Kazuko's story, and in 2011, an hour-long segment on her was also included in a show called Sekai no Kawaii on Natachi, which is Scary Women of the World, broadcast by TBS. Even more than just having programs about her, especially her time on the lamb, has left an impression on the public in a novel called The Cry of the Loser Dogs, which is a bit of a loose translation. Makeinu no toboe. Makeinu no toboe. A bestseller that got a lot of attention for talking about how Japanese society views unmarried women. Author Sakai Junko tosses out a casual reference to the case, saying, quote, When someone who's lived a long while has a loser dog, and by that she means a woman over 40 who has not gotten married yet, gets married more than being surrounded by a feeling of safety. She feels an upwelling of emotion like Fukuda Kazuko thinking, and with this, my long life on the lamb has ended. And in Japanese, that's Makeinu Seikatsu Nagaku Tsusuketa Hito ga Kekon Shutatoki Kofuku Toyu Yori wa Ando no Hyojo ni Kuru Mareteiru no mo. これで長い逃亡生活が終わったという福田和子的心情が湧き上がってくるからなのでしょう。
and in this case the loser dog thing is like she's using that sarcastically kind of that's like a term that she's using to show how society views unmarried women of a certain age and she's not like actually calling them losers because she herself is one um kind of unrelated but i just thought that was interesting so there are a couple cases that are similar there's the case of nishikuchi akira who was wanted for murder and continued to murder people while on the run in 1963 to 1964 so it was actually before her time but i guess the similarity is that it was a person, a murderer who was on the run for a long time. Well, only a year, but you know. Then there was the Shinagawa homosexual murder case. It's said that the suspected woman used 11 pseudonyms to make a living by beating four men while on the run. And was called the second Kazuko Fukuda. And then finally, the Lindsay Ann Hawker murder case. Um, which was a British woman who I think was an English teacher who got murdered in Japan. And that's a similar case because the suspect, the man who killed her, had plastic surgery after he escaped and it became, you know, a hot topic and he was started to be referred to as the male version of Kazuko Fukuda. I was thinking about doing a case on that one, or a video on that one rather, because it's pretty interesting. And along with those programs that I mentioned already, there were a lot of other ones about Kazuko Fukuda. There's one called Face, which is based on the case of Kazuko Fukuda, produced by Shochiku on August 12, 2000. Another one called Actual Record Kazuko Fukuda, made by Fuji Television, Kyoto Television Production on August um, 2002. There was The World Astounding News by Nippon Television Production in December 2009 that featured Kazuko Fukuda. There was Ramayo Shock File World Scary Women, which I guess is what I mentioned before. Sekai no Kohai on Natachi. That was in 2011. There was Sunday Big Variety Nippon Case Files Why Do Criminals Run Away? produced by TV Tokyo. In March 2012, there was the true story drama special women's crime mystery. Kazuko Fukuda Plastic Surgery Escape for 15 Years, which was by TV Asahi Toei Production in 2016. There's actual record 10 Scary Women. Okay, I guess 10 Scary Women. Okay, yeah, that's different. But it was also by TBS in 2017. There was Direct Hit. Shinzo Sakae, Mother Kazuko Fukuda, by Fuji Television Network in 2018. Then there was World Extreme Mystery, Unknown Mystery of Kazuko Fukuda, The Most Famous Fugitive in Japanese Crime History, by TBS in 2021. Then finally, The Serious Case Volume 1, Kazuko Fukuda, 14 Years and 344 Days, A Woman Who Continued to Run Away by Nippon Television Production, which is a Hulu exclusive in May 2002. I mean, in May 2022. So that one's very recent. Obviously, people are still interested in this case in Japan. Sitting on the floor is very uncomfortable. <laughs> so, so that's all I have for this video. I hope you enjoyed this case. Obviously, it's a little bit different since the majority of the story was her evading capture and running away, and the actual murder was kind of like a footnote almost on this story. Let me know what you thought about it in the comments. And, yeah. Thank you for watching. Have a good day or night. I hope you found this video to be relaxing. And I'll see you next time.